continuing our look at the upcoming congressional races in the general election. We're talking about District 1 today. Colonel Mark Robertson joining us for running as a Republican for District 1. Colonel, good to see you, sir. Thank you, John. I'm glad to be here. And welcome to the world of politics. You were saying this wasn't something you necessarily thought you would ever do, but you felt compelled to do it. Yeah, I've never run for office before, but I felt I couldn't just sit back any longer and hope that somebody else does something about the direction we're going. Let's talk a little bit about your, your, your background. Uh, what is it about your, your military service, your, your business career that you think suits you well uh, as a congressman? Good, well, I'd say there's three things. First, I have deep ties to the, to the district. My wife and I raised our family in the first congressional district. Um, I owned a business in the district. Uh, we went to church in the district, uh, shopped, um, played, I coached uh, Little League in the district, so we have deep ties to CD1. Two is I have national service. I served for 30 years in the Army. I enlisted as a private and retired as a colonel. One of my last assignments was to the Pentagon, where I served uh, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for policy, so I've worked on national level policy. And finally, I have international experience. In those 30 years in the military, I deployed to 10 different foreign countries including combat zones in Afghanistan, Kuwait, and Iraq. And we'll talk a lot about the military service in a moment, but first, specifically with District 1, you're talking about your ties there. Um, what do you believe is in District 1 not being addressed by the incumbent? Yeah, so I've spent the last 18 months talking to people in CD1. I've talked to them in their homes, at their businesses, in, in small meetings, in, group, in large group meetings, and over and over I hear their biggest concerns, and their, their biggest concerns are inflation, crime, the, the poor education system in, in, our, in our valley, uh, the, the border issue, and water. So those are the top five issues that I hear from the people of CD1 who they feel are not being adequately addressed. So how would you address, let's talk, let's start with inflation. How would you address inflation if you're elected to Congress? Good. I have a uh, degree in finance and an MBA. In fact, I taught finance at UNLV. I know how the economy works and I know how to fix inflation. It's not that difficult. Inflation is when there's too many dollars uh, chasing too few goods. We had government spending, horrendous amount of government spending, printing, borrowing and spending money we didn't have. And then we had a government shutdown that shut down our factories, and so we weren't producing the goods that people need. That will naturally lead to inflation. But in fairness, you know, whether it's in the Senate or in Congress, there's a lot of smart people that get elected there, and a lot of them have backgrounds in finance. What maybe different do you think you could provide to uh, other lawmakers to try and get things done there, and then also to the constituents in District 1 that they're not getting now? Yeah, so as you pointed out, I'll be one voice of 435. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I will find other like-minded um, members of Congress, regardless of what party affiliation they have, like-minded who feel like we cannot continue printing, borrowing, and spending money we don't have, who support the idea of a balanced budget at the federal level. So would you support a, a balanced budget amendment or a, a, a make an enforcement of a balanced budget? Uh, and I guess looking back, uh, what were your thoughts on the efforts to put money into the system, the PPP and sort of the coronavirus pandemic relief funding from the White House? Yeah. Well, the, the, there, the audits are going on now about all of that money that was injected into the, into the system. And so much of it was wasted in fraud. I mean, we were sending uh, stimulus checks to people in prison. And, and the stimulus checks weren't targeted to the people who were most injured. It was just this broad uh, uh, distribution of, of, of money to people. And many of those people didn't need it. I, I talked to members of uh, people who work for the government, and they said, I never lost a paycheck. I don't know why I got a stimulus check. Now, they, they cashed the check, but, uh, but there was a lot of money that was wasted, and that's what caused the inflation. So it is, a, is it as simple as raising interest rates and cutting spending? What else would you want to see done in Washington? Yeah, so um, the, the cutting spending is the big part, but also we've got to stop paying people not to work. Right now, we are paying people to stay home and not work, and that means we, don't, we have a labor shortage in the United States, an artificial labor shortage. We've got to give people uh, incentive to go back to work, and you stop paying them and, and require they, to, they work to get any of these benefits, then it'll solve our labor issue. Let's talk about another issue here that you mentioned is key, you believe in District 1, the issue of uh, immigration, illegal immigration. Uh, we've seen some horrible stories from down on the border the last couple of weeks. How do you think 
illegal immigration is not only affecting District 1, but the country, and what would you like to do about it? Yeah, so we see a flow, a, a, a flood of drugs, gangs, and guns coming across our borders. I have, I have a personal friend who lost his daughter to fentanyl uh, poisoning, and that fentanyl is coming across our border. It's not just people, it is uh, drugs and, and guns and gangs that are coming across those borders. Those affect the people in CD1. So what's the solution? We got we to uh, secure our borders. We've got to finish the wall, and we've got to use electronic monitoring, and then we've got to give the Border Patrol agents, the people on the ground, the resources they need to keep the criminals out of our country. Once we've controlled our border, then we need to fix our broken immigration system. Which is something that people have been trying to do for as long as I can remember and probably as long as you can remember. What can be done differently to try and get that, uh, sort that out? Yeah, again, I'll be one voice of 435. I'll no, look for <laughs> other people. I'll look for other people that will, uh, will join me in the effort. The, the, some of the provisions that need to change. Right now we have this lottery system. We spin the wheel and that determines who comes into our country. That's no system. We ought to decide who comes into our country. And they ought to be people who can contribute to our economy, people who embrace the culture of America and want to be Americans, not some luck of the draw who comes in here. We ought to decide who comes in. Uh, you, we've talked a lot about your, your military involvement, obviously your long career with the, with the military. Uh, right now, there's a lot of effort and a lot of money being poured into Ukraine right now to try and help their efforts against the Russian invasion. At what point do you believe either A, American servicemen and women should go into Ukraine, or B, that, that money should be turned off? Yeah, good questions. First of all, I want to applaud the people of Ukraine. They, have, they, have, they are standing up for the defense of their own country. We haven't seen that in the, last, in the most several wars. You saw the, the men, the fighting age men in Afghanistan wouldn't stand up to the Taliban to protect their wives and their sisters and, and their mothers. In Syria, you saw fighting age men and women leaving the country. I, I, I sat in a coffee shop in Turkey and, and listen to Syrians complain that we, the Americans, weren't doing enough to free their country as they sat in a coffee shop in Turkey. So I applaud the Ukrainians for fighting for their own country. And I think it is the right thing that we've been giving military support, but it would not be the right thing to put boots on the ground. When do you think the U.S. should stop? Is there at some point a, a line where the U.S. Is, would, suggest, would say, we can't afford to keep doing this anymore. We can't afford to keep giving billions of dollars to Ukraine as noble as the fight is. Yeah, so, so I, believe, I think right now the U.S. is playing the lion's share of the support to Ukraine as far as uh, money and military equipment. I think it should be Europe that's said, stepping up. Europe, is, it's, this, is the, this is the doorstep of Europe, Ukraine is, and Russia is a much bigger threat to Europe than it is to the United States, and the Europeans ought to be picking up the slack and, and contributing significantly more than the United States. You mentioned your time being deployed in, in, in Japan and in Asia. Do you think the focus from a military standpoint should be in the east instead of in the west? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think the uh, Ukraine war is showing us that uh, Russia's military is not as big a threat as we may have thought it to be. But China's is, and China's is a growing threat, not just militarily, but economically as well. Though the, democratic, the, the demographics of China suggest they may not be a superpower for long. They, they don't have the, uh, the population coming behind to do that. Let's get back to a couple of uh, domestic issues here. Uh, recently, Roe v. Wade was uh, overturned by the Supreme Court. Uh, we know that Nevada has it in state law, the, the issue of abortion. But if you're elected into Congress, is there any level of uh, abortion support, federal funding, or anything along those lines that you can uh, that you are in favor of? Okay, first I'm unequivocally pro-life. I believe um, with the majority of Americans that there should be a, a limits on abortion, that abortion shouldn't be unlimited. Um, and I, I applaud the decision to overturn Roe Wade, uh, Roe versus Wade, not just because I'm pro-life, but because it was the right thing to do in our Constitution. Even Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that there were some issues and some concerns with how the Roe decision was made. So the, the Roe decision, the overturning Roe, put the power back to the people. 
where it belongs. It doesn't belong to the federal government, it belongs with the people. And I'm surprised to see so many career politicians complaining that uh, power was taken from them and given to the people. That's where it belongs. Do you support, though, or do you agree that there are, should be legal abortion at some level in, in, the, in, uh, in the term? in the term. I oh, I, I know what you're saying. Yes, I do believe that... Uh, you don't believe in an, an outright ban on correct. all abortions? Correct. I believe, that's right, I believe in the case of rape and incest and the life and health of the mother that, a, that abortion uh, may be the right decision. Okay. Uh, finally, let's talk about uh, the issue of gun uh, control, gun rights, and, and bills that were recently passed in Washington uh, to try and do something. We've just seen this horrible shooting that happened in near, north, uh, north of Chicago recently. If you're elected to Congress, what measures would you support for whether it's background checks, whatever the case may be, on a federal level? Yeah, first of all, I, um, I, my heart goes out to those families that were at that parade. My wife and I and our, our family were at a parade in Boulder City yesterday when this was going on. And I lived in Highland Heights. My, my little brother was born there. Um, I was too young to have any memory of it but my heart goes out to those people. And we see this crime wave, wave uh, crossing America and, and we've got to do something to, to address this crime. The defund the police uh, movement has taken police off our streets and liberal uh, prosecutors have put violent criminals back onto our streets. We have got to address the, the crime issue across the country, but also as I talk to families in CD1, they too are concerned about safety in their neighborhoods and in their schools. So if you're talking about addressing the issue of safety, uh, would that include putting restrictions on who's allowed to buy guns and what kind of guns they're allowed to buy? Yeah, so I would not restrict law-abiding ab citizens' ability to uh, defend themselves and their families, but I would strongly support prosecuting criminals who use guns in, in the con in, in com uh, when committing a crime. I also support the idea of finding ways to keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill as long as we don't take away their due process rights. Does it make more sense, as you're talking about putting more efforts into prosecution, does it make more sense to put effort into the aftermath of a horrible tragedy or before in terms of getting guns off the streets? Would it make more sense to, to do it before the, maybe before the crime actually happens? Yeah, we need to prosecute uh, the people who are selling guns illegally. We need to stop the flow of illegal guns coming in through our southern border. Listen, if you just take guns out of the hands of, of, uh, of law-abiding citizens, that won't stop criminals from having guns. And the, so that's one of the reasons I say we need to secure our border, because a lot of the guns are coming across that border. So yeah, those are things that need to happen beforehand and then tough prosecution after the fact. Right. Colonel Mark Robertson, appreciate the time, sir. Good luck to you in your uh, race in District 1. We'll be in touch. Thank you, John. Appreciate it.